Hello, I'm Wakar Akil from Duke University, and I'll be presenting our work titled Untangling Header Bidding Lore. This is a measurement study on an online advertising technique. This project is a collaboration between myself, Dabupam Bhattacharji, Balakrishnan Chandrasekharan, Philip Brighton Godfrey, Gregory Lawlin, Bruce M. Maggs, and Ankit Singler. Let's start by understanding how the traditional real-time bidding process works. It starts in a predictable manner. The browser sends a web request to the publisher's ad server. A publisher is a website that uses third-party online advertising. So Wikipedia and government websites are not publishers. Google and Facebook are not publishers. But New York Times and Washington Post, for example, are publishers. The publisher's web server sends back a response, and based on that response, the browser will contact an ad server. An ad server is a platform that publishers use to manage and sell their inventory. The ad server will contact an ad exchange where a real-time auction will be kicked off. And as part of that auction, one or more advertisers will be requested for bids. These advertisers will gather data on the user from data brokers. This data may include age bracket, income bracket, interests, and other tracking information. Based on this information, the advertiser will decide how much it wants to bid and send that bid back to the ad exchange. Once the auction is finished, these bids will then be forwarded to the ad server. Now, at this point, the ad server may decide that it has received a high enough bid and terminate the process, or it may decide to contact another ad exchange based on the publisher's policy. Now, at this ad exchange, a new auction will be triggered, and similarly, advertisers will be requested for bids, and they will send bids back. And at the end of the auction, these bids will be forwarded to the ad server. Now, at the end of the entire thing, the ad server will decide which bids win, and the winning ad, final ad, will be sent back to the browser. So this is like a waterfall process. Ad exchange 1, if that doesn't meet the criteria, then ad exchange 2, and if that doesn't meet the criteria, ad exchange 3, and so on. In contrast to this, header bidding places the browser at the center of the process. The start is the same, the browser contacts the publisher's web server, and the web server sends a response. But in this response, there's special JavaScript that tells the browser to contact one or more ad exchanges in parallel. So the browser, instead of going to the ad server, is directly going to the ad exchanges. The real-time auctions at these exchanges are the same as before. Uh, one or more advertisers are requested for bids. They collect tracking information on the user and send bids back to the exchanges. And then those exchanges forward these bids to the browser. The browser sends then the highest bids to the ad server, and then the ad server may compare these bids to other demand sources that the publisher may have configured, and then decides on the final ad to show and sends it back to the browser. So in contrast to uh, real-time bidding, the, uh, there is more transparency here because the publisher is con controlling the entire process through its own JavaScript. And instead of a waterfall model, we have auctions going on in parallel. Header bidding was started in 2013 to take control back from big players like Google. Google was using the waterfall model to give an unfair advantage to its own ad exchange by allowing it to bid first on the most valuable users. The parallel process in header bidding instead guarantees fairness for all. And uh, because more advertisers are able to bid, it likely increases the revenue that publishers are able to collect. Perhaps that is why we are seeing that among the top 1,000 publishers on the web, 80% now use header bidding. And this is in an online advertising industry that is worth $300 billion. But because the user's browser is at the center, uh, this entire process is very sensitive to network latency. In previous work, there's only been one measurement study on header bidding. And to do their analysis, they scrape websites instead of using real data, and they scrape from a single vantage point. So their network view is limited. Moreover, because there are no real users involved, the bids that advertisers are sending are unrealistic. 
and they don't focus that much on latency. They don't identify the causes of the latency that they observe. But they conclude that header bidding has non-viable performance overheads, and by performance they mean latency. But uh, based on real data that we collect and a deeper dive into latency, we identify what causes the latency and how it can be addressed. We show that latency overheads in a header bidding are not a fundamental problem and uh, it can be addressed easily. To conduct our measurement study, we developed a browser extension for Chrome and Firefox. We use the PreBidJS library, which is a popular library that is used to implement header bidding on different websites uh, to get data on how many ad slots there are on a web page, what exchanges are being contacted, and what kind of bids they're sending. We also use the Performance Timing API to get a timing breakdown of the bid requests and responses. And we used the Web Extensions API to capture the IP addresses of the ad exchanges that the browser contacts. We also store the domain name of the web page visited, not the full URL, just the domain name, and the user's set city level location. We took great care to protect the privacy of our users, and uh, we don't attach any uniquely identifiable tag to our users. We don't collect emails, phone numbers, IP addresses, and so on. We went to our institutional review board and uh, they said that we didn't even need an approval because we weren't collecting any personal identifiable information. The source code for this extension and the data set that we collected are available at this address. To get an overview of the kind of measurements that we collected, we have uh, 400 volunteers and we collected data over a duration of eight months. Our volunteers come from about 356 cities and 51 countries. About half of the users are from the US and most of the other half are from Europe. Some from Canada, some from India and so on. 5,000 unique websites, 100,000 page visits, about 400,000 auctions and 462,000 bids. So let's get to the measurements. Because the ad exchanges are being contacted in parallel, does it make sense for a publisher to contact as many exchanges as possible? On this graph, we see a CDF of the number of ad exchanges a website contacts. And we see that 60% of publisher websites contact only four or fewer ad exchanges. Maybe they do that because all bids are kind of the same. And once you have seen bids from four ad exchanges, it doesn't matter whether you see the next 10 or 15 or not. But we see that that is not the case. All bids are not the same. And there is considerable variation as can be seen uh, in the graph below here. Uh, which is a CDF of the CPM. CPM is cost per mill, which is the amount of money that an advertiser is going to pay to show an ad 1,000 times. And we see that for the uh, winning CPM, the median is a dollar and 15 cents, and the median CPM of non-winning bids is only 35 cents. So all bids are not the same, and there's variation of about two orders of magnitude. We also see that contacting more ad exchanges uh, results in higher CPM for a particular ad slot. On this graph on the x-axis we plot the number of ad exchanges contacted and on the y-axis we plot the median CPM received for an ad slot. And going from one exchange contacted to eight we see that the median CPM actually doubles. 95% of the data is between uh, one to eight exchanges contacted. So this, um, a little bit of randomness here, is not of much significance. It's resulting from lack of data. The flip side of contacting more exchanges, as we see, is that the auction duration also increases, as this graph shows. Auction duration would be the delay uh, between loading a page and showing ads to the user. And that delay is bad because it's just a bad user experience. Um, when ads load, content on the page might move, videos might start playing, or some flashy images might load. So it's just a bad user experience. And moreover, uh, we know from the e-commerce industry that delay causes a dip in sales. And uh, from the search engine industry, we know that 
that uh, delaying the showing of the results decreases the click-through rate. So it's quite plausible that if you delay uh, showing ads to the user, the likelihood of them clicking on an ad also decreases. So the publishers want to keep the auctions short, and that is why they are not contacting more ex ad exchanges, even though it increases revenue. That is the central revenue latency trade-off of header bidding. To keep the auctions short, publishers set deadlines after which any bids that arrived are just discarded. And a typical deadline would be about two seconds to three seconds. But as we see in this graph, uh, time since auctions start on the x-axis and the fraction of CPM received on the y-axis, we see that about 90% of the CPM is received within the first second. So by setting longer deadlines at like three seconds, publishers are wasting time waiting for bids that will probably not alter the result of the auction after all. So they could, you know, uh, shorten the deadlines and save some time there. Um, now we look at individual bid requests instead of uh, looking at the auctions as a whole. We can observe individual bid requests from two vantage points, one inside the JavaScript library and one outside of the library in the extension. So um, inside the library we call in browser, that is the blue line here, and uh, from the extension we call the we call it on the wire. So that is the actual network duration once uh, you know. Uh, once the request has spent its time in the network queues of the browser and so on. So on the wire duration will be smaller than in browser duration. And we see that there's a large difference, 174 milliseconds in the median between the two timings. That is because the browser may be prioritizing other content over the ads, which makes sense. But another major reason is that the JavaScript implementations of these uh, ad exchange integrations are not optimal. Some integrations are even synchronous when they're supposed to be in asynchronous. So if an if an exchange integration is buggy and it makes a synchronous request, all the other exchanges that are supposed to be contacted in parallel end up waiting for the first exchange's response to come in and only then they go out. So that these kind of inefficiencies and you know prioritizing other content uh, adds a delay of about 174 milliseconds in the median. Now we will focus on this red line and break it down further. We see that about 60% of requests to ad exchanges are made on pre-existing persistent connections. And for such requests, the median duration is 230 milliseconds. And for these requests, time to first byte dominates. Time to first byte is the time difference between the last byte of the request being sent out and the first byte of the response being sent be, uh, being received. And in this case, it includes one round trip time and all of the server side processing, which includes the auction that takes place at the exchange itself. So it makes sense that TDFB dominates. For the other 40% of the connections that 40% uh, of the requests that are made are non-persistent connections. The median duration is 352 milliseconds, and 38% of the time is spent on TCP and TLS handshakes. In this graph on the x-axis, we plot the total request duration, and on the y-axis, we just break it down to different steps, which includes the DNS resolution step, the TCP handshake, the TLS handshake, time to first byte, and the time it takes to download the response. The responses are fairly small, so it doesn't take much time. And um, we can see that in the median duration, which is at about 352 milliseconds, uh, TCP and TLS handshakes take up considerable time. When we uh, investigated the exchanges for support for newer protocols and enhancements that reduce the number of round-trip times required for handshakes, we found that only 11.4% of the exchanges support TLS 1.3, only 6.6% .6 support QUIC, 
And although TCP fast open is supported by 76% of the ad servers, TFO support on the client side is a bit tricky because Linux, Windows, and Mac OS all disable TCP fast open if they see, um, you know, um, timeouts. And even if the even if the operating system has TFO enabled, the browser may not. For example, Chromium. Uh, on which Google Chrome and many other browsers are based, has removed TFO from all of its builds. And although Firefox supports TFO, it disables TFO by default. So uh, none of the advantages of TFO are being um, delivered. Now we move from looking at the client side to the ad exchange itself. Uh, we observed the top 10 most popular ad exchanges that we saw, and six of them showed similar behavior to at least one of these, so we only analyzed these four. We see that Index Exchange has 88 deployments in different cities, uh, and uh, Rubicon, AOL, and Credio uh, all have, each have 20 different deployments. We also observe that sometimes there's bad request routing at these ad exchanges because we see very large RTTs. This graph is a CDF of the round trip time that users see to these four different ad exchanges. And as you can see, uh, for Rubicon, the medium round trip time exceeds 100 milliseconds. And for even the same ad exchange and for users in the same city, we see large variation, which makes us think that there is bad request routing. Uh, for example, for users in New York contacting Rubicon, we see round trip times ranging from 10 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, which you know signals that they're being sent to a much farther deployment than the 10 millisecond users are being sent to. When it comes to total handshake time, which includes TCP and TLS handshakes, we see that Critio and AOL gain in handshake times by using TLS 1.3. TLS 1.3 requires one less round trip time compared to older versions of TLS. This graph is a CDF of the total handshake time, and we see that uh, even though um, AOL had a higher round trip time than Index Exchange, uh, it makes up for it in total handshake time by using TLS 1.3. When it comes to time to first byte, TDFB, we see that Critio has a huge advantage as this CDF of uh, TDFB shows. Critio um, at the 80th percentile takes about 100 milliseconds, while at the 80th percentile index exchange takes um, 325 milliseconds. This suggests that the exchange side auctions at index exchange are not properly optimized. It may also be that Credio is in fact just uh, not even holding a real auction and just sending pre-configured bids to us and that is why index exchange is suffering. But we can't know for sure because we don't have visibility at the exchange side. We are only sitting in the user's browser. In conclusion, we saw that the revenue latency trade-off that many in the industry know about but has never been quantified before is in fact valid. As you increase the number of ad exchanges you contact, your revenue increases, but so does the delay in showing the ads to the user, which is bad both in terms of user experience and uh, in terms of the click rate on the ads. We also saw inefficiencies at both the implementation and infrastructure levels of header bidding. We saw that exchange side auctions can be optimized like Credio does and an exchange does not. You also saw that low RTD protocols and enhancements like TLS 1.3 and TCP fast open and quick can really help in case of non-persistent connections which are 40% of the total connections. Uh, these protocols can reduce latency by about 38%. But most importantly, we conclude that header bidding latency is not a fundamental problem with the architecture like the previous work suggests. If we take the measures that we highlight, we can bring header bidding latency in control and uh, it, can, it can work uh, great. 
For future work, we would like to increase the measurement coverage of the study. We have used the browser as the vantage point, but we would also like to look at uh, header bidding from the perspective of an ad exchange. And we would also like to compare uh, the revenues that publishers are making by using header bidding as opposed to traditional real-time bidding. But more importantly, we look at header bidding as, as an opportunity for privacy-preserving advertising. Because the browser is in control of it all, is at the center, uh, it can, you know, enact very stringent privacy controls, you know, store information, targeting information locally, and block all kinds of tracking by third parties. It could send ad requests with user-approved tracking information embedded in those requests. These ideas are not new. They have been proposed before, like in Privad, older one, and more recently in Brave ads. But uh, Privad and similar techniques were proposed before header bidding came into being, and because they required significant changes in the existing methodology, they didn't go anywhere, unfortunately. And Brave ads, on the other hand, is, you know, it, it uses many of the concepts that we are talking about, but puts Brave at the center of it all, when at the end of the day, the user should be at the center. This is all from me. Thank you for watching my presentation. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you.